good afternoon and um, happy new year. Um, so we're starting our meeting a little late because we came out of our executive session and then we had some little technical things we're discussing there. Um, so 2021 is our improving year. And um, I'd like to welcome the budget committee to the first meeting of this year and the second year of the term. I'm Leslie Tarkington and would each of you introduce yourselves beginning with Leslie T Moriarty. Hi, I'm Leslie Moriarty. Jeff Raymer. Happy New Year for me too, I'm Jeff Raymer. Andy? And I'm the fourth member, Andy Deuce. Good okay, thank you. This is the uh, budget committee second meeting of the day, um, which includes any vote on the pending litigation uh, followed by the BET budget committee regular monthly meeting items. The first meeting was an executive session to hear pending litigation. We continue to operate under the governor's executive orders first put in place more than 10 months ago due to the pandemic. The budget committee is deferring the parking funds January release of conditions after Mr. Geiger and I consulted with Deputy Chief Mark Marino. The budget committee will discuss the release of conditions with the parking fund department budget scheduled for February 5th and vote on the release at its February 17th regular monthly meeting with no expected further attendance by the deputy chief. This is similar to the way the release was handled last year, making the requirement for his attendance only one meeting. The town's annual budget cycle will begin next Tuesday, January 26th at 6 p.m. with a first selectman's presentation of the town's fiscal year 22 budget, followed by the Board of Education Chairman Peter Bernstein and School Superintendent Dr. Tony Jones presenting the BOE fiscal 22 budget. A public hearing is scheduled to follow the presentations at approximately 7 p.m. These times are approximate and the meeting will be continuing. There will be a sign up form online for those who would like to provide written comments or request to speak. The budget committee will continue with fiscal year 22 budget meetings with the town departments thereafter. That schedule is available on the town website. The budget committee expects to operate in a Zoom hybrid environment. Also, since the town continues to operate a COVID-19 schedule, the BET Budget Committee uh, adjusted its February meeting on February 17 to meet at 1 p.m. during town hall working hours. So thank you. Um, again, I think um, uh, on our agenda, um, the first item is SE1, um, which is a legal settlement. And I don't believe there are any uh, pending settlements to vote on, is, is that correct? Or do we have a motion to vote? I mean, right now I'm just planning to move on to HD4. That's, that's acceptable. Uh, okay, okay, so- That's acceptable our, to me too. Mm -hmm. And Andy? I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay, so um, I am just looking through, um, our list here. Um, okay, so um, our next item is HD4, the health department um, for- I apologize, I'm going to have to interrupt. I've been contacted that Deborah Edwards has something to say. She's asking questions and contacted Shira. Is, is she somebody who should be- Oh yes, yes, she is. Um, she should be attending our meeting. She's uh, representing the health department. Um, Caroline Baisley said on Friday afternoon, um, that a Great. meeting had been called. I'm sorry, so, yes. then should I bring her up as a panelist or leave her as in an attendee? No, no, she can be brought up as a panelist. I was looking for her name. I didn't see her that she had signed in. Okay, she, she's coming up. Thank you very much. Sorry for the interrupt. No, this that's helpful, Jenny. I didn't see her there. So Deborah, um, you can unmute yourself and I think you should be your video if you have video um, should so welcome to our meeting, Deborah. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy, happy New Year to you too. Thank you so much. Oh. So um, we're you're here to discuss HD4 um, for the health department um, approval to use a, a grant of sixteen thousand one hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars. Would you like to describe that to us? This request is like you said to accept the sixteen thousand one hundred sixty-seven dollars 
is from the State Department of Public Health and Human Services block grant. This is the second year of funding of a three-year grant. Um, this is to help support the National Public Health Accreditation Program, which uh, the health department has been working on. And, but since it's a very long process, we're still working on it and we need to continue. Um, so we need to um, have a, con a consultant who will assist in fulfilling some of the requirements we need to uh, apply for the National Public Health Accreditation. And this is what the money we use for. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions for Deborah? Andy. Uh, I may have missed something, but it's taking, it will take three years to, to complete this uh, hiring of this consultant. Is, do I understand that correct, uh, Deborah? No, it's um, a three year contract. The funding for the first year was $16,167. Um, this is the second year for the same amount. And the third year is about the same amount. Um, but the, we had a consultant who helped us finish certain processes of the, of the accreditation, but we need to continue because there's so many multiple steps that have to be taken and so many things needed. Okay, so to get the accreditation uh, teed up, and uh, the consultant's helping us uh, last year, this year, possibly, possibly next year uh, to do that. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Yes, Liz. Um, this process has been multi year. If I calculated correctly, um, your first one, you've utilized funds from a, um, a prior grant starting in November 17th. December 2017, then I believe some money from September 2018 grant, January 2019 grant, and October 2019 grant. That totaled so far $68,475. I assume there was some money in 20 that maybe the 16,000 you're requesting today. So um, I guess I, I support the national certification, I think that's the direction that the State Department of Health is pushing all departments to do. But yes. this has been a very long and a very expensive process in terms of uh, incremental funding that had other utilizations. You know, you could have had access to these funds to do um, increase other areas of your services or, or support your operations another way. I just want to understand what is the expected timing, because I believe now it says you're going to file in 2021. I think last year you told us it would be earlier. Granted, there was COVID and that probably had a little bit of an impact on your department. Um, but, um, but there should be an urgency in completing this. There should be an urgency to be able to use our grant funds for other other purposes that directly uh, benefit our residents. And so I just want to, if you can help us understand what what the real expectations are for completing this process and getting back to um, focus in other areas. Well, like you said, due to the COVID, everything was pushed and priority was the COVID. Um, but we still have someone doing the work. We can, because of such a bad pandemic, we can't just push other people who were working on it to um, stop with COVID you know, it goes by priority. Our expectation, I believe Caroline would like to put in the um, $14,000 that we're still holding from one grant to pay for the fee for the application. So um, yes, it's multi-process, there's a lot of, it's, it's been taking other health departments just about as long, if not longer. It's just so many things that you request and then you have to update and then keep going. So it's based on how much information they want. And then after we send in the application, they still contact us and they let us know if things needed to be added or if things need, they're gonna have a, a you know, come in, view the health department. And like I said, just many different steps to the whole process. Once you get certified, 
what uh, period of time does this deferred certification last? I believe it lasts about five years and then you have to, it's not as difficult, uh, but to re assign, I mean, to go again for the application, but it's not that you have to start from the beginning anymore. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeff, is your hand up? Yes, um, uh, Leslie said my concerns very well. Uh, do I understand that we could have used these? It's, I think we were pre prior years calling these the HER grants. Um, uh, we, we could be using these funds for other things if we were not using it for the accreditation process. From what I understand, no, it's especially this special three year grant uh, contract was specifically just for the accreditation because they know that so many other health departments need the help. Um, but the other ones previous, Caroline, I would have to check with Caroline, but I think there's, there's only so many things you can apply for for help in these grants and you cannot just, you know, pick and choose, you know, if it's not in their qualification chart, you can't use it for just whatever you want. I had the impression looking at the paperwork that you had provided that the opportunity existed that we could also be using these funds if you wanted to for high blood pressure, high blood pressure screening or cholesterol screening um, instead if we wanted. Uh, but yeah, I gather that you think that's probably not the case. The, these, these are funds that you need, that if you want these funds, you have to use them for this accreditation process. Well, if you started, I know if we started like we did before in the previous years to, they want us to finish it. Let me see. And what's the benefit to the town of getting the accreditation? From what we believe the accreditation is when further grants are given, if you're not accredited, you might not be qualified for the grants. Let me see. Let me see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Andy? Uh, following up on that question, how long has accreditation been offered to municipal health departments? Uh, is this something that's come up just in the last couple of years? Or has this has been around for decades. No, it's it's come up in the last couple of years. Okay, so so municipalities around the state are, are I guess, are all in the process as we are of applying for accreditation for this. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Some have received it, but others, and they had other people working on their uh, application, but they had some full-time people working on it. And again, to, to pull up on Jeff's question, once we get accredited, we'll have greater ease of, 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 of getting future grants uh, or, or have access to more grants or what, what's, what's, if you could specify, what would be, be the upside for the town? From what I understand, the upside would be, we would either get continuation of the, some of the grants we already get, um, but there might be additional grants if you're accredited um, that other health departments will not be able to uh, uh, qualify for. Is there an ongoing annual cost once we're accredited that we would owe to the uh, National Public Health Entity? No, um, there is uh, the five year when we have to reapply um, to continue the accreditation, um, but most likely there'll be another grant to help you pay for that. <laughs> hmm. I know there will be a fee, but not as expensive as it is to get started. Okay. So thank you. I, I don't have any further um, questions on this. I think it's great that um, the, we there are grants available to um, basically support the financial costs of the accreditation. And, um, you know, it appears that this is a worthwhile cause, but um, we're using our town employees for the business at hand, and we have the additional funding here for um, this other um, accreditation. So do we have a motion? I, I, Jeff. I, I, I move that we uh, approve this and recommend it to the full BET. Uh, and uh, if relevant, I, I propose that it be a, um, a routine item. Thank I'll you. second. And those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so that vote is four, zero, zero. 
So um, thank you so much, Deborah, for coming today. And um, thank you and the health department for all the work you're doing um, related to keeping us all healthy and safe in this COVID-19 environment. So thank you. And thank Caroline Baisley also, who I definitely um, will. was not able to attend because of our uh, 12 o'clock time rather than 11. Um, Roland, I think we'll move on. And I think you've sent us some update on economic conditions just a little while ago, very I, recently. I did. There was an issue with the, uh, the detailed revenue report. And I, okay. I resent it. Uh, in terms of the, the three revenues that we always look at, uh, we're almost at budget through six months of the year. And by next month, we should see to that by quite a bit. So those conveyance and building permits continue to, to do very, very well. They're doing great. It's particularly uh, conveyance um, in today's environment. Um, and I guess uh, building permits too, right? Yes. Do you know if the building permit number, is it comprised of many uh, smaller application or was there one large number that maybe disproportionately impacted that number like we had last February? Yeah, you know, I have to check on that. I'll, I'll check on that, see if it's one big one like we had a few months ago. Yes, I there was saw one. newspaper that, what's the that, Pete? Bruce, the Bruce Museum for 350,000 in October is part of that. Yeah. Okay. Because I know that building permits started off more slowly at the beginning of the year. We weren't sure that it was going to continue to build, but it, the past three months, it's been um, at much higher levels. So. And overall, we're about seven and a half million dollars ahead of revenue compared to a year ago. And it's a kind of all over the place in addition to the three that we just talked about. So that that's good news. Andy? Uh, question. Uh, I wonder if there's a, a lag historically between building permits and conveyance uh, collections. Uh, my guess is it would, but I can't quite see it from the data that's presented here. In other words, we've had this boom the last year with the conveyance taxes. And I, I hope that might translate to uh, a more buoyant building uh, uh, permits uh, next year, uh, which, which would be a, a good, good thing to have. I, I guess that may not have an answer to that question, Roland, but it's just. It's <laughs> the, the question I've also always or have asked in the past, and we don't ever get a breakdown, is the um, building permits between um, tax exempt properties such as the Bruce Museum um, and our taxable properties. So building permits don't necessarily mean that the town is increasing its grand list, um, fortunately or unfortunately. So Roland, um, you talked, um, do you wanna go talk any more about revenues or do you wanna go straight uh, to- Just the, one thing on the expenses? revenues, uh, our auditors asked us to change how we handle certain things that we were calling revenues, one of which is the uh, amortization of the bond premium. So that will be netted against a debt service expense, against interest. And the other one is the uh, healthcare premium that the employees pay. Uh, they want that netted against the health insurance cost. So going forward, we're gonna see a reduction in interest cost and in healthcare expenses because we're just moving the revenues to net the expenses. So more but like FAS, more like FASB accounting is, is how they've been accounting on, in yes. the other private sector world for years. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, so, I'm sorry. So, yeah, sorry. So, so, I mean, because we look, um, when we're looking at the budget, we, uh, when we look at revenues, but, but as we're sitting there looking at what our total budget is and what the percentages of increase is and what the impact uh, on mill rate, I guess mill rate doesn't get affected so much because you've net out the revenues, but um, uh, uh, it will, um, uh, comparing the upcoming year to past years, it'll make us look as if we uh, have less cost uh, as if our costs on medical insurance premiums have gone down, as if our costs on the uh, interest expenses gone down, right? Right. It, it's uh, somewhere around $10 million of lower revenue and lower expenses. 
Yeah. So it would be great just for people like me that forget things uh, in our old age. It'd be great if during the budgeting process uh, later this month and next month, uh, if you'd be reminding us of that factor in there so that we can mentally interpolate uh, last year, this year, et cetera. Sure. Got nothing else, Leslie. So thank you. <clears throat> thank, thank you, um, Rowan. Did you did you want to cover the um, department expenditures also? Uh, we're running, you know, a little bit ahead of last, which is to be expected. Uh, there's some timing issues with uh, payments to, for example, external entities. Uh, GEMS was paid in December this year, and it was paid in January last year. But, uh, you know, just you can see that uh, we're pretty close to last year's uh, expense levels. And um, are there any departments that you, other than, I mean, external entities, but any departments you'd like to point out in particular? No, I mean, you can see that it's, it's pretty close to last year. Okay. And it's All interesting, right. you know, we're in a COVID period now where we weren't yet last year. Can I ask a question? I, this may be detail as we look forward to the budget. I've been thinking about some of these uh, departments. Um, the Board of Ed has not yet um, identified in just financial terms the impact of COVID on their operation. There are a lot of pluses and minuses. Um, and there's not a lot of information on staffing costs, but all of their incurred expenses for staff would be showing up in their expense level, correct? That there's not yeah. any accrued or deferred compensation that we would see, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. The only adjustment to uh, salary expenses would be, and I don't know if it's happened yet, uh, you know, we accrued the the salary increases in the years where we didn't have the contract settled. So as we're paying the retro uh, salary amounts, those will be reversed out. And, and the settlements were lower than what was accrued. Is that correct? So there'll be a yes, positive there, impact on that. The positive impact there. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions or shall we move on? So that's great, Rowan. Thank you for this information um the monthly just so we know the monthly um cpi inflation rate um for december at the 12 months um for this area um increase um again it's not seasonally adjusted but back to 1.6 percent close to the 1.7 percent we have in the budget guidelines so um p are we ready to move ahead with the Next item here. Are you, are you going to share the document? Sorry? His his deck, do you want to do you want to do the share of the document of his deck? Uh, so sure, the public Pete, can see sure, 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 Pete. Why don't you do that? And um or uh, you'll need to make Pete Pete will need to be made a co-host in order for him to share. I don't have the document. It's okay. It was part of our packet, if that's it was part of our help, packet. Um, Roland, can uh, you put Jenny it Larkin? Up? I, I have the I have the document if you want me to share it. Let's or, do that. Well, or anyone who has it, yeah, they just have to be Jenny, a co-host. Jenny or, or Roland, whichever. Jenny, okay, you got so it right there, that's great. Just tell me specifically, this is the... This the is the rating, Town of Greenwich rating. rating presentation. Okay. It says Moody's Investor Service. It should be right and after Roland's be. economic reports. Okay, I'm looking at those, those are, yeah. Uh, here we go. Okay, um, let me share my screen. So Pete's going to run through, give us a high level review of um, what we presented to the rating agencies and um, then a, just a quick summary of the great feedback we had. Okay, is um, Jenny, are you, if, if I need to uh, go a page, are you the person I just say next to? Yep. Okay, uh, I want to preface my remarks by um, sharing uh, with the BET the uh, situation with the uh, current financial advisor. The current financial advisor is Hilltop Securities. Uh, second year of a, a three-year, two-year option contract. Uh, the principal 
uh, contact person for Hilltop was Bill Lindsay, uh, working with his partner, Mark Chapman, who you never see because he, between the two of them, they've got 30 to 40 municipal clients and they share them. Uh, and Bill has the Greenwich account. Uh, he's had the Greenwich account since May 15th of 20, 2007. And uh, it, at that time, we, we went to market for the first time. We had a bond issue of 11,385,000. It had two components. It was 2.5 was the public safety facility. That is the police building. It was followed up by the fire building. And uh, the other piece was the Pomeranz Tuckman purchase of 8,885,000. The reason we went to market in May was uh, the closing was originally scheduled for December of six, it got canceled. Uh, and we went to market uh, to accommodate the closing uh, of the uh, property uh, of the, the second piece of the Palmer's Tuckman uh, acquisition. Uh, the uh, 2.5 was uh, Mr. Uh, Jim Lash was the first selectman and it was a trial balloon uh, to put for the first time the bonding out there. Uh, and he, he, we ran it through the RTM and the BET with bond resolutions. It had basically three pieces. Uh, 22 million was Glenville School, 9.1 million was sewers, and then the other 22 million was basically other uh, projects. And then subsequent to that, uh, we had our first real ban issue in, in, in following December for 45 million. Uh, update, uh, the, a week ago, uh, in, the, in the middle of preparing for closing on the $30 million bond issue, the $55 million bond anticipate, anticipation no issue known as bans and the $10 million refunding, uh, Mr. Lindsay's computers were shut off and his phone was shut off. He was unceremoniously, his office was closed between him and his partner. Uh, with the assistance of Robinson and Cole, uh, the finance department's treasurer's office in the Rhode Island uh, office of Hilltop uh, Securities, we were able to successfully close last Thursday on all three of the pieces uh, and pay off the debt service that was, was due. Uh, Mr. Lindsay uh, informed me this morning that he's hooked up with a New York firm, uh, hoping to retain a lot of his Connecticut uh, clients. And um, he's, uh, what we have now is a situation where I'm entering into the third year of the Hilltop uh, present uh, Hilltop Securities uh, arrangement. Um, I have the option of within seven days of simply terminating. Uh, I've got the advice of the law department. Uh, I they suggested that I send a certified letter if I choose to terminate the contract. However, I don't necessarily need. Uh, a financial advisor for the next six or seven months. Uh, and before I segue into what the financial advisor does and go into the presentation, I'll stop there. Does anybody have any questions regarding the use of a financial advisor? No, I, I don't have the ability to see raised hands. Can I ask one question? I, I don't recall, um, did, did Bill Lindsay ever provide input as our um, OPEB actuary reports or the retirement board's actuary report is finalized or that only came from uh, the actuary? The, uh, the, retire the pension plan, the retirement and the OPEB uh, have been performed over the years simply by the actuary. It was previously Ed Friend Incorporated. We did an RFP about 10 years ago and it's been uh, Hooker and Holcomb was doing the OPEB uh, after their contract uh, 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 was up. We did another RFP and we've been using Boomershine. The only role that the financial advisor plays is he acts as an intermary, intermary uh, he, and I'll get into this with the credit rating. He shares information with the third part, with either Moody's and S&P. So he's just a handoff guy, uh, but the actuary completes the- uh, Okay, the so Bill, Bill only really is involved in our, our, our debt um, 
issuance and certainly was advisory to the debt and fund balance policy committee, but that work's completed for the next, you know, probably two years. Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, um, uh, before, I, I, I just want to follow up on that, Andy. Uh, the, uh, Andy had his hand up. Uh, we, uh, I've told the story many times. Uh, it goes back to the, uh, the spring of 2011 when Moody said, and Bill Lindsay actually said, uh, Moody's told him, he says, you guys, you went from a negative fund balance to a, a positive fund balance, even though it was small. He says, you should, you should develop a fund balance policy. And along with that, we decided to have a debt uh, policy. And Bill Lindsay has been working with me every two years since 11 and the, uh, the audit committees. It started in, uh, I think Jeff, Jeff remembers this. Uh, it was initially the audit committee. And I'm not sure if it was Steve Walko or if it was Mike Mason. It was spun off into the special projects uh, groups over every two years. So he's been instrumental uh, working with the BET on the debt policy and the fund balance policy. Andy had a question, Leslie? Uh, uh, I assume to replace Bill, we need to do an RFP or can we just engage him directly? Uh, uh, best practices, uh, it, to be in compliance with the purchasing policy, we should do an RFP. Uh, I, I've already, it's, fr it's relatively fresh. I've got it, it's already written. Uh, I, I could issue it. Uh, as I told Bill Lindsay this morning, uh, as, uh, I haven't been billed yet by Hilltop Securities. I would like to clear out all the billings so there's no money owed between the town and the hilltop. I'll probably issue an RFP uh, in May or June. Because as I stated before, we don't need their services until October, November. And, and May, or May or June issuance of an RFP would be enough time to get a response and, and to uh, fill, fill this uh, vacancy. Yes, we got uh, four responses last time. Um, there was, uh, between Bill Lindsay uh, and Phoenix uh, Advisors, they handle almost all the Connecticut uh, accounts. Uh, there's there was two other outliers that maybe have one or two accounts in in Stanford. So, basically, the answer to your question it's yes RFP, and they'll have to uh, go through the RFP process uh, as as far as being hired. So, so Pete, I have I have two questions. Um, First, um, do you, um, ref, you know, call Bill Lindsay or, you know, periodically need information that isn't the major projects by the um, the BET? Will that cause you any inconvenience? And is there any kind of like interim measure that needs to be taken here to make sure that you get the information you need that can get a sign off by our town administrator? I just want to make sure that whatever you need. Um, you have available to it as well as the BET, obviously. Uh, that's the bigger picture, picture which Andy just, just raised, but I wanna make sure you're okay on all of this. Okay, um, we, we need no information from Bill Lindsay. Uh, he was able to send us all the debt service schedules. Uh, we've got the debt service for the three issues, the bonds, the bans, and the refunding. Uh, so we're set for the CAFR next year. Uh, we've got all the updated schedules uh, through that cover us through June 30th. I don't, there's no information I need from Bill Lindsay between now and, and October. Uh, however, uh, we've offline, we've been in contact. Uh, but the answer, the simple, your, the simple answer to your question is no, we've gotten everything. Uh, thank you. And then I have one more question. Um, are you free to share what New York firm he went with? He didn't tell me. Uh, it, it, and just if I could just, it, as far as confidentiality, uh, the reason I'm speaking here on a recorded public meeting is uh, I sent to you the email that was sent to 30 to 40 uh, towns. This is a common, this is common knowledge through the community, the financial advisor and the bond, bond attorney uh, uh, community. So this, this is not, uh, this is known throughout the state of Connecticut. And, um, that's why I shared that email this morning about the, uh, the town of Coventry taking a survey uh, of uh, what to the 30 to 40 towns, what do you plan to do with Hilltop? 
Thank you. And uh, Jeff, I see you have a question. Hey, so I assume in the anticipation of responses to an RFP that you in the interim will probably have some conversations with Hilltop and some conversations with Bill Lindsay to try and understand what underlies the event that you've just described. Um, the, there's a, a yes and a no. No, I ha have no uh, plans to have any conversations with Hilltop. Anecdotally, and I'm waiting for a time period to lapse, I'll talk with Bill Lindsay offline to try to determine uh, what exactly is the rationale uh, to uh, close the Connecticut office. They, they have in New England, uh, when, they, when Hilltop notified all the clients and the client list and you saw in that email this morning, 30 to 40 of them, they basically have one shop in Rhode Island and they were helpful for us to close last week and they have two shops in Massachusetts. So they've got three covering all of New England. And I'm not familiar with any of the, uh, what they do in New York. But you did, uh, I'm gonna wait for uh, time to go by and I'll try to find out from Bill what exactly happened. You didn't mention it in your, in your narrative, but um, uh, it's worth mentioning uh, publicly also that uh, Bill Lindsay was with the prior firm. Uh, we RFP'd for the current contract uh, and it did seem to be a pleasant plus at the time that we were accepting the bid of the company to which Bill, Bill Lindsay was, uh, was joining. Uh, we didn't exactly follow Bill Lindsay to the new firm, but it was a, a, a considered plus at the time that our same Bill Lindsay would be at the new firm as we left the old firm. Um, with that in mind, it just seems to me that I wouldn't, uh, that, that in your shoes, I would like to know what um, Hilltop's uh, description is of what led to the decision by Hilltop to close the office, uh, just in case it has a bearing upon our uh, inclination to follow Bill Lindsay to another firm, the firm in New York or something. Okay. Andy? Uh, uh, Pete, I, I know you mentioned it. We, get, we don't really need a financial advisor until we get back in the fall with the, with the capper and the, and the uh, official statement. But there could be things that arise for which having this kind of counsel would be helpful before then. And, and so is there a cost with proceeding with the RFP sooner, not later? I, I don't say there is one. And I would, I would encourage you to consider doing that to, uh, to fill this position, uh, this role uh, sooner uh, than as opposed to waiting till the fall. I, I wasn't going to wait till the fall. I, uh, I thought I said I'd send it out in May, but uh, I could I could send it out in March uh, earlier, but right now, uh, you know, as far as the highly technical uh, questions, and I know you know, Andy, is uh, I rely more heavily on the legal and the highly technical issues with Robinson and Cole. Okay. Uh, and and I could always pick up the phone uh, with Bill if I don't foresee uh, needing Bill in the next six months. Okay. Bill Lindsay or his firm. Uh, th thank you so much, Pete, for this update. This is a very important, I think, uh, you know, we've had, the town has had a lot of good support um, from uh, Bill Lindsay and his firm. And I know it's been a good working relationship with you, um, but I think it's the successful um, issuance of our debt that um, makes that relationship so, you know, have gone so well in the past. Um, so therefore, we're, we'll go back to um, a quick review of the, uh, rating presentation and um, if you can just share um, some highlights of the of the meetings, that would be great. Okay, um, it's uh, a lot of you saw the presentations uh, on the 17th, uh, but I wanna, no, 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 <laughs> cover page please, just, not yet. Um, thanks, Jenny. Uh, I wanted to really walk you through the process from start to end, because a lot of what's in this document, a lot of you, you, you saw, in, we went through it. Um, the process starts with the financial advisor in early November. I send an email to financial advisor, Bill Lindsay, and I ask um, Bill, I said, I need a financial schedule and I need the Word document and I need the Excel spreadsheets to start with the official statement. So I start uh, with the official statement in early November. Along with that, we we have the CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report that has to be done. So 
before we get to December 17th in the actual rating presentation, I have to complete a preliminary official statement. It's called the POS. I have to, at a minimum, have a draft CAFR, preferably a uh, completed CAFR. And uh, between Bill Lindsay and myself, we complete the, the uh, preliminary official statement. And uh, with the finance department led by Roland Geiger, uh, uh, Natasha uh, and Maureen in the finance department, we complete the CAFR. And these are very important documents that the credit rating agencies rely on, more so than this presentation. Also, um, Bill Lindsay will share with them, uh, through Bill Lindsay, they get the budget book containing the 15-year CIP. We send them the debt policy, the fund balance uh, policy, et cetera. So they've got, before they even get to this presentation, meaning Moody's and S&P, a lot of information. In addition, they've got our budget guidelines every year that the BET sets, whether it's September, October, or November. They Google us. Uh, it, there's probably only one or two occasions where a financial issue came up, I think maybe five years ago at Nathaniel Witherall. And they, they do this with all of their clients is pre before the rating presentation. So they've got a wealth of information on the town before they get to this uh, presentation. So next, Jenny, what we do is, uh, this is the team. Uh, it's uh, the first electman, town administrator in Roland helped me and Bill. Uh, I'm the main presenter and um, these are the, the, the people that help out with the, uh, the presentation before the credit rating agencies. Next, and this is the topics next of, of the presentation. And what we have is, as I say before the first selectman, uh, whether it's Peter Tessie uh, for the uh, eight, eight plus years prior to um, Fred, Fred Camillo was on his second uh, presentation this year and Peter uh, Tessie prior to that, we, we try to populate them with topics that are somewhat not financial, but more interesting uh, in the area of economics. Uh, and we give them uh, the opportunity at the beginning of these presentations to speak. In the case of uh, Peter, I, I actually went this, uh, this morning and looked up a couple of the old uh, presentations from a few years ago. And Peter liked to uh, talk about surveys, for example. He was very big on his biennial survey, satisfaction survey. He put up the Access Greenwich uh, app where people can call in uh, and ask for public you know, customer service, whether it's uh, trees down or uh, something uh, they want changed at the beach. So Peter would talk about satisf satisfaction surveys. Another issue in previous years was the when he created the Greenwich Economic Forum, Ben would come in and he would talk about uh, Lean Six Sigma. And uh, three years ago, one of the topics was closing the police defined benefit uh, plan, which subsequently happened. Now, in the case of uh, Fred, we're in the midst of uh, among, among us is this COVID-19 pandemic that has tremendous economic uh, social, uh, financial impact on everybody in the country, the whole world. So he took the opportunity to say some of the things that he was talking about relative to COVID-19 that are not necessarily financial, which I'll talk about later. And one of, one of the other topics was the down, uh, downtown at the bottom of Greenwich, Greenwich Avenue or up and down the outdoor dining he talked a little bit about the waterfront development, the Greenwich Plaza update. Uh, he, he mentioned in the end with her all request for proposal, which you're all familiar with. And there's a couple of BET members that are on the, uh, the transactional or the RFP uh, team uh, looking at Nathaniel Witherall. Now, as I spoke before, the police contract was three years ago. Now the hot topic is, is settling the fire contract uh, in the one of the last bullets down there and whether or not we can close them out of the DB plan. And then we'll have all of the unions in the management and confidential uh, 
all out of the DB plan. It'll be completely closed. Uh, cybersecurity uh, was big and Actually, uh, we covered it in detail last year and, and we left it off for the Moody's presentation. And if the, the people, uh, the BET members recall at the end of our presentations, Moody's went back and said, well, how about cybersecurity? We actually didn't have that bullet in there in the first presentation. And uh, we, we pointed out to them that cybersecurity is, is a, a major uh, initiative, a major concern and we've got this team uh, that consists of, um, led by Ben Branion with uh, my risk manager, Megan Zaneski and Tom Klein and uh, Michael Ting from the Board of Education. And we, we spent, we've got in the budget this year, a million three uh, for cybersecurity. You, you all know, cause you're on the budget committee or, or the uh, BET. And we approved $749,000 uh, on the town side in 557. So cybersecurity, uh, was is extremely important to us, and they were glad to hear that. Next, please, if anybody has questions, please stop me. Okay, uh, the the situation with the debt and fund balance policy, <clears throat> as I stated, they have every two years we send them the debt and the fund balance policy statement. The if you recall, this was December, I'm sorry, yeah, December 17th of Thursday, we had the nine o'clock and the uh, 11 o'clock, the presentations, and we had yet to have the new debt and fund balance policies. And if you recall, the BET uh, updated the debt and fund balance policies that night, and we send it to them the next night. So uh, this is these are examples of information that they have prior to these presentations. We send them 10 year budget updates. Uh, we send them, they get the CIP out of the budget. And we. this is when they're doing the rating, uh, whether it's S&P or Moody's, these are A pluses on our scorecard is to have these policies and not only have them, but integrate them and use them. Next, uh, Jenny. Uh, everybody knows we have the largest grand list by far, uh, the equal, Equalized grand list, middle bullet, 49, almost 50 billion. Uh, the full value per capita is 787,954. Again, uh, when it comes to the scorecard, these are A pluses. Uh, we're, we're a somewhat primarily residential uh, as opposed to some other towns like a city, like a Stanford, a Norwalk or a Bridgeport. But we're way ahead of uh, number two and number three, meaning the city of Stanford and the town of, uh, or city of Norwalk. And as you all know, uh, because you are the instrumental, the last bullet, we postponed the revaluation one more year uh, because of the COVID experience. Next, Jenny. I hear a voice. Was there a question? No one has anyone, a hand yeah, raised. Anyone who's not speaking should just mute themselves in general. Okay, I thought I heard a question, somebody speaking. Um, no change in the top taxpayers in, in the, um, the uh, employers. If you go to the back of the CAFR uh, in page 133 and 143, you'll get the list of them, uh, the top 10. And then we, uh, for GFOA, government finance officers, uh, compliance, uh, all of the towns that get that certificate present this format and we give them who the top taxpayers were 10 years ago and the top employers. And if, if you look, you, know, you could see that basically the top 10 tax players with, with maybe one exception from 10 years ago are the same top 10. Uh, the top employers, same thing. Uh, and what's, what's interesting about the top employers is three of the top employers are nonprofits. Uh, number one is the town of Greenwich. Number two is the hospital. And number, I think it's seven, is uh, Brunswick. Uh, so three of our top 10 uh, employers uh, are tax exempt. We do get pilot payment in lieu of taxes for Greenwich Hospital. And then you can see where, the, again, the COVID-19, the theme is the, the COVID-19 and the impact on budgets and communities. Some other, the, we are way below the national and state uh, averages for unemployment, but we were impacted uh, if there was no COVID, I would say that number would be closer to 3%. Uh, 
still it's somewhat low compared to other towns and, and other cities uh, throughout the country. Next, Jenny. Again, okay, these are the COVID revenues. Uh, they're, uh, they're as of um, December 17th. Um, if you recall, Nathaniel Witherall uh, got a million one before June 30th, which had an impact on our audit. Uh, if you recall during the audit committee meetings, uh, they had to defer uh, opining on the single and the, uh, fed the, the federal and state single audits because they didn't get guidance from the Office of Management and Policy at the federal level on how to audit COVID revenues. So we got an extension on the single audit to uh, January 31st. Uh, the Board of Education, you can see that they applied for uh, almost $2 million from the ESSER grant or a Corona Relief Grant. And then community development, you've got the two tranches of uh, Tyler Fairborn's been before you twice in the RTM asking uh, for pass-through uh, monies for, uh, we call them external entities. They're the nonprofits throughout town. And there was two pieces that make up the 873. And we've got uh, a million five that uh, the risk manager, Megan Zanaski is in the process of getting from FEMA as far as reimbursements. Issa Ias that you don't see here, uh, I'm gonna throw this in anecdotally, but the, the, remember the hurricane, Issa Ias, if I'm saying it correctly, there's probably five variations of how to pronounce it. <laughs> the governor, I'm sorry, the state, the president, uh, Donald Trump, declared the Connecticut uh, state the, uh, disaster area. So we'll be getting hundreds of thousands of dollars in relief for that hurricane. Uh, I just thought I'd throw that in because it's something that happened in the last couple of days. Next, Jenny. Uh, this, this is uh, not a revelation. We're consistent. We've got one of the highest tax collection rates in the state. Um, what's interesting here is the bottom bullet. Um, we, there was a lot of concern uh, in uh, discussions in late spring when the governor had his executive order uh, on the tax deferment uh, program. It had no impact. Uh, it was report, other than the fact that it was deferred from uh, August uh, 1st due date to uh, October uh, 1st. Uh, we were made entirely whole by the first week of October. What's interesting is uh, as I was discussing this slide uh, on the morning of December 17th, uh, the email started flying back and forth. Uh, the governor issued his executive order Wednesday night, the night before, and decided to extend the deferment uh, program for the second half of the uh, year, uh, and wasn't even able to, to discuss it at this point uh, because it was so new uh, that day, December 17th. There was concern with the RTM on whether or not they would have to vote on it. As it turned out, it basically was able, we were able to, by no vote, uh, Heather Smergliel, the tax collector, was able to extend the tax deferment to now April 1st. Uh, as, as we speak, again, we don't see any impact on the tax collections and we don't anticipate any other than the fact that some of them be deferred. So the next uh, slide. Again, uh, the, red, the red bars are, are the uh, total tax collections. The reason we're over 100% is because they're taking the blue bar, which is the current levy, and adding the prior year levy to get over 100%. So the, collection, the tax collection rate is great. Next levy, next uh, slide. Uh, uh, again, the operations, uh, you're all aware of this. Uh, you approved the CAFR in December. It was reported at the, uh, the uh, December audit committee meeting, slight uh, surplus on a budgetary uh, method. Uh, a lot of that was driven by the Board of Ed, which was able to save a lot of money on their uh, bus contract, and there were savings in other areas. And then there's the gap surplus. Uh, we replenish the fund balance uh, every year. Um, a slide or two from now, we'll, we'll go further into the fund balance appropriation. Um, and then um, there's, uh, in a subsequent slide, uh, the, what the auditors did, and they did this five years ago, is uh, we've, we had the $68 million uh, of uh, fund balance on a gap basis. They took 4.2 million and called it non-spendable. 
which means it was not in the assigned, it was not in the unassigned classification. Uh, they did it five years ago at, for 5 million, it washes out. So when you get to CAFR for June 30th, that 4.2 will be uh, uh, covered. And next slide, uh, in a subsequent slide, I'll show you how that works. Uh, and I'll come back to the Vienna Witherall. Here's the, uh, they also look at the budgetary uh, surplus uh, which is different than the gap surplus. Uh, basically, uh, from top to bottom, uh, we enjoyed uh, surplus in the taxes. Uh, where you see the negative numbers on the licenses, the fines, uh, the charges, they were all part of the COVID-19 impact. The intergovernmental, 4,110,000, I'm, I'm in the, the variance column. The 4,000,001, that's basically the pilot uh, the ECS, education cost sharing, that's the SPED, special education reimbursement, and that's the bridges that we don't budge for. That's why that's a large uh, surplus. The use of money would have been a lot uh, higher. The interest rates didn't start to come down until late March, so we, we had a, a 1.2 surplus. That has been adjusted as far as the budget for the current year, where we only budget 500,000 and it was covered in the economic report from Roland about 30 minutes ago. Uh, you can see the negative use of fund balance, the 15,278. That's where the previous slide referenced that we replenish that every year because of conservating, conservative revenue budgeting and expenditure budgeting. And then if you could drop down to the expenditures, uh, basically most of them are surpluses created by the, uh, we budget 100% of salaries and don't fill them. I think we're over 50 sal uh, vacancies at this point. The schools, the 2,148 variants, uh, as I said, a lot of that was the uh, fact that the, the bus contract came in very favorable because we weren't uh, busing the children to the schools. Uh, and then the fixed charges is a little bit misleading uh, because uh, if you look down, it's actually, uh, in the accounting uh, presentation, it's you really have to drop out the negative 5.7 uh, because of the way we treat transfers. So the surplus was really about four something. The bulk of that was the healthcare and the um, workers' compensation. Next slide. Okay, here's the total fund balance, gap basis 68.67, available 6446. Uh, the difference, the 4.2 is the auditors reclassified 4.2 of Nathaniel Witherall is unspendable. It washes out uh, after this year. The, the reason it'll wash out is, uh, next slide, is uh, we, oh, it's not the next slide. Uh, if you can go back one, let me just finish this slide. No, 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 stay right there, fuck that one. The, um, we, the, under the old uh, fund balance policy, there was three components, the general fund, uh, we didn't use the 64, we used the unassigned, and then we had the risk fund, which was the million six, which got replenished. Uh, right now it's up to about 4.6. And then you've got the capital non-recurring uh, fund for eight, nine. Uh, we, with the new fund balance policy, we use the budgetary uh, fund balance, which uh, if you go back, back one slide, uh, Jenny, is uh, this is the 59, 808 on the bottom, now becomes the piece that uh, goes into the, um, the uh, fund balance policy. So if you can go forward to two uh, slides, Jenny. This is a very favorable slide. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it translates, uh, it goes into the credit reviews uh, where we are budgetarily, we're very strong. Uh, we don't have uh, negative fund balance dips. The one dip that you see, if this was a golf uh, uh, scorecard and you had a bogey, it was 2017. And that was caused by the state of Connecticut pulling back uh, a, a bunch of our uh, uh, ECS and uh, SPED monies uh, that uh, amounted to about $5 million, which created that very small dip uh, for 2017. But other than that, we steadily have a, a good replenishment of fund balance and modest surplus each year to get where we're up to uh, that 68.67. Uh, Next slide. Again, this, uh, this, is, uh, this goes to the point where um, 
Nathaniel Witherell had a slightly better uh, operating deficit than two years ago, which created that large uh, deficit of uh, over 4 million that had to be replenished. Uh, and then the, the bottom bullet is significantly important for two reasons. The credit rating agencies and the auditors ask us, what are you gonna do about Nathaniel Witherall? And we tell them, you, the VET, uh, have a plan to replenish these uh, deficits. And when we've got an experience by doing it five years ago, where we wiped out the 5 million, and we've demonstrated that we're going to replenish it in the current year, that is something that both the auditors and the credit rating agencies want to hear. Uh, and so that's somewhat erases some of the bad news for the Nathaniel Witherall, uh, Witherall operating results. Next slide. Uh, this is basically the adopted budget. Uh, this is uh, the uh, 2021. Uh, this, I call this the COVID-19 budget. The highlights are that the mill rate went down uh, less than a percent, is the 0 0.079. Uh, and then the, the other key uh, issue is in the middle bullet, the education was flat funded, uh, where they, they were funded at the preceding year of two years ago. Uh, the debt service uh, on the bottom, uh, I'm sorry, not the debt service, the capital projects uh, that got authorized, there was 51 million. 45.7 of it is uh, through uh, uh, is bonded. That's through borrowing, and the four million dollars is paid for through the mill rate and cash, and that ends up the being uh, shows up in the 999s in the fixed uh, charges uh, budgetary line items. Next, uh, okay, this is this is the email uh, the, the uh, slide I was waiting for. The um, this one was a little clumsy in our uh, in our. Uh, uh, compilation and a little bit misleading. The 19.1 appropriation for fund balance, which I've said is we replenish each year, has got two components. 15 is regular and 4.1 is Nathaniel Witherall, where we're replenishing Nathaniel Witherall, we're taking care of the negative fund balance. Uh, in the where it's a little bit uh, awkward is the 5.6. We should have we should have sub made another sub bullet. That's got two pieces. Uh, 1.5 of it is in the regular uh, budget. So the 4.1 and the 5.1 are the contribution to Nathaniel Witherall. And the 1.5 is not part of the uh, use of fund balance. And then there's the risk reserve, which I uh, just uh, mentioned, where we went from the 1.6, uh, one we're up to about 4.6 currently. Uh, operations, uh, you just got a report about 40 minutes ago, 45 minutes ago from Roland on the results. So I don't need to repeat what Roland just told you uh, six months through the year. Next bullet, uh, next uh, slide. And then, as I said before, uh, beside the budget, the CAFR, the official statement, the policies, the CIP, et cetera, et cetera, we, they have, we give them uh, through Bill Lindsay, the budget guidelines. Uh, so, so they read uh, our minutes and they, they know what the BET is presenting and telling what the town and BOT and all the departments uh, are, are being expected of them as far as the uh, BET operating uh, budget guidelines. Uh, next slide. This is basically uh, the three issues. Uh, see, these are the usual suspects as the annual paving, the annual highway maintenance, uh, the the infrastructure for the BOE, that's the non-large projects. Uh, this this uh, 30 million has some of the, uh, the fire station upgrades. The refunding was for, all sewer issues. They were eight. Actually the 208R means that's a refunding of a previously refunded uh, uh, borrowing from eight, which was refunded a second time. And 12 and 15 uh, were, uh, they're all sewer uh, issues. And then the demands, the 55 million, uh, half of that's gonna be turned into bonds next year. Uh, and then there'll be a, a, a new tranche of, of new money uh, next year when we borrow. And again, they're just, there's probably 40, 50 projects in there, a lot of them small. And the, the, they repeat the, animal, the annual paving, uh, the infrastructure on the Board of Ed, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, next slide. These are metrics that are taken out of our um, uh, OS and our uh, CAFR. And they, uh, when we go to the uh, credit reviews uh, that are subsequent to this later in this package, they're basically all A++++ for the town of Greenwich uh, compared to our peers. Uh, they're, I mean, have a net debt burden of zero, uh, 0.46 is phenomenal. Uh, the, uh, the, the rapid debt retirement and um, basically uh, they're all tremendous metrics uh, that makes it easier for us to get our AAA uh, affirmed each year between the credit rating agencies. And then we, we have talked about in the past the, um, the BOE uh, facilities plan, which spiked the CIP. It doubled it from, I think, 700 and something million to about a 1.6 billion two year, a couple years ago. Uh, and we, we give them a brief update on that. Uh, but they can see in the CIP 15 year plan exactly what's in the, uh, that facilities plan. Next slide, please. And then um, as, as we uh, talked before, uh, FIRE is, is nearing the completion uh, of arbitration. The Teamsters is the new one, uh, the new contract to go out. Uh, and then the, the, we have a healthcare plan that's fully insured as opposed to self-insured. There's a risk involved when you self-insure. And then the uh, workers comp and the uh, prescription dental or self-insured pieces. And then the final, um, Next slide is, uh, I'm sorry, we've got the pensions. Again, they take this, uh, these, are, these are June 30th uh, figures as, as opposed to July 1st actuary reports. Uh, and you can see the, the pension is at 155 million uh, net pension liability. Ratio dropped a couple percent from about 78 to 76. Charter says you, you fund 100% of the actuarially determined employee contribution which is the ADEC, ADEC, formerly known as the ARC, the Annual Required Contribution. Uh, as I stated before, the police are closed, effective uh, two years ago, and the fire, uh, we're looking at, uh, let me back up, uh, as a trade-off to closing the police, uh, we, we gave them some COLAs uh, for the current police members that were grandfathered in. It had an impact on the uh, ADEC, the ADEC, as far as the pension contribution. Then the discount rate uh, for July 1st was dropped from 6.5 to 6.25. That has an impact. Uh, we were up to over 26 million uh, on the, uh, for the next year's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, up to 28.3 million, I believe it is, the ARC. And um, so they have impact on the uh, future budgets uh, with the increase in the uh, contributions. The next slide is um, OPEP. Uh, it was created as a trust uh, January of 08 when the, uh, the RGM uh, ratified that subsequent to January, uh, retroactive to January of that year. Uh, even though it's not in the charter, uh, OPEB was not around 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's, uh, BET has a policy to 100% of the ARC. Uh, they didn't pick up the language called ADEC yet. Uh, and then there's the liability the ratio is actually dropped to about 47, 48%, uh, the bottom bullet. And then the last slide is that it's the conclusions. Uh, I don't need to repeat these. And then uh, if we can, before I get into the credit rating, uh, credit reviews that are after this, anybody have questions on the presentation? No. Uh, Pete, if you know, uh, I'm curious, the other AAA uh, rated municipalities, uh, what sort of a uh, ratio on the net pension liability do they present compared to our 76%? Do you, uh, do you have any idea? I, not off the top of my head, but I believe there's an email from, uh, there's an email from Greg Stump, I'll try to find and send to you, that has, uh, has them statistics and also the reason uh, Leslie Tarkenton was actually the person who requested this email. They wanted to know what the other discount rates other towns were using. And I'll look for that email uh, and send that to you after this meeting. 
Uh, okay, don't make a big deal out of it or something. If it's a lot of work, uh, we'll we'll deal with it another day. But if if it's easy, I'd be curious to see it. Thank you, Pete. The, the only thing I could I could tell you off the top of my head is because I working with Greg Stump uh, last week is I know West Hartford is forty percent funded. Okay. And it had to do with a totally a totally different topic, uh, and I happened to Google West Hartford. Uh, on, on some research and saw that they were 40% funded. But mm -hmm. other than that, I don't, I'm not familiar with all the towns off the top of okay. my head. Okay, it's a Bill Lindsay question, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, do you, uh, can we go into the sure. credit reviews? Um, yeah, I think I think a couple of quick uh, comments on each of the credit reviews. I mean, yeah, obviously. It's, uh, yeah, but, uh, I'm sorry, Leslie. No, that would be great, Pete. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is this is basically this is this is this is the completion of the process. The step one I told you about, where we create an official statement, we have to do a CAFR, we give them all this information, then we have the credit rating agency, which I would just went through you, and this is what comes out of it. And if you if if you could drop it down one one page one more page, um, this is uh, basically some of the the criteria. This is the uh, the key indicators, the metrics I talked about. Uh, for example, on the top, uh, the very top line, third one down, the full value. You could see the equalized grand list is which is pretty consistent, slightly below fifty million, fifty billion. Uh, the, the population is pretty uh, steady. Uh, you can see the full value per capita, the 787, uh, 954 in the 2020 column. This compared to our peers, uh, this is phenomenal. Medium family income is uh, phenomenal. I mean, these are great when you compare us to the US median. Uh, these these uh, are pretty, uh, that's why we get a AAA very easily. If you go to the net direct debt, uh, I wanted to point something out that uh, in the 2020 column, the 209,855, you got that right there. Look at the trend. The trend is, and this goes to the debt policy where uh, we went from 234 to 228 to 222 to 209 next year, meaning uh, at the end of 21, it's gonna be 200. The reason I point this out is it's the ability to get capital projects done. We're averaging $40 million a year in spending and slightly dropping. When you've got a 15 year financing plan at 1.8 billion and, uh, or give or take a uh, hundred, a hundred million, whatever. And if you're only spending 40 million times 15 years, that's 600 it kind of diminishes the value of the 15 year CIP because we can't basically spend what's in that CIP. And I know that Rollins has spent so much work uh, working with the, CI the uh, special projects group and stuff like that. But, and I'm not, I'm not being critical of the, uh, 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 the, the intent was to show that the net direct debt is dropping, not going up, which is, uh, something that potentially in the future could be alarming. And the reason I say it's alarming is the fact that we borrowed 30 million helped us in the budget process where the debt service dropped by four point something million. I think it was between four and $5 million. And it's gonna happen again next year. The problem is, is that if the, we get a spike and this trend reverses, you're gonna have a budget challenge two or three years from now where the debt service is gonna spike upwards, where that 209 is gonna become maybe 215 or 220. So this is a good trend that could reverse itself to the detriment of balancing the budget in a, a two or three years. Uh, the If we drop down, keep going. Some of this is, okay, this is, um, Again, this is, um, I wanted to talk about this because what's interesting is if you look at the discount rate and the column on the right, and 
you could see the, uh, the reported unfunded pension bill is 6.5. This was last year's discount rate, which is dropping to 6.25. You got, see the 7% that's OPUB. The reason I bring this up is Moody's uses 2.7 and 2.7, which balloons the liability. You could see where the, the 2.7 for the pension is 493,400. So if we had used them type of uh, discount rates, the corporate rates they call them, this is our, our pension liability would be phenomenally much higher uh, using them rates. For some re reason, Moody's likes to put that in there and adjust the, uh, these long-term liabilities to, to their liking. Uh, and then, um, let me see, this, that's basically all I wanted to say on that. Uh, you drop it down. I think I've got one more area I want to cover. This is, um, okay, this is our scorecard. And uh, if, if you look uh, it on the left side, You've got different categories, economy-based, 30%, not the uh, finances, 30%, the management, 20%. This is how they rate us. And um, in other words, the economy-based section, which has our $49 billion grand list, they take each of these categories, and there's subcategories, they equal 13 uh, different subcategories, and each one of them gets a rating, and each one of them is compiled, and it, that's how they arrive at a triple A. And some of the, I mean, beside the grand list, you've got like categories of how big is your fund balance, how much cash do you have on hand, what's your operating history as far as the budgets, debt to revenue, debt to full value, there's 13 different categories, and this is how they score us. And there's actually a document uh, that goes behind Moody's and S&P, about 20 pages long that breaks these down on how they arrive at a AAA. <clears throat> Notching factors uh, are on the left, which is not applicable. It, it's, uh, there's 13 notching factors for Moody's. In other words, to go from a AAA to the worst possible junk bond status, there's 13 notching factors we, there, it's not applicable because we were not notched down to a double A uh, category. So that's basically how they score us. Uh, and S if we drop down uh, to S &P, the um, S&P, uh, keep going, Jenny. <clears throat> keep going. It's just basically, I don't want to repeat uh, the the S&P is basically the same as Moody's, basically. And I'll, I'd only be repeating the scoring system. They have the same type of scoring system. But the bottom line is we, we're we AAA. We, are, we don't have any weaknesses, OK? Uh, the, there's nothing out there that could damage the AAA uh, except for a period of two or three years where we had large deficits or some type of external forces that impacted our finances uh, materially. So that's it. And this is, this is the final product from start to finish is the triple A's. And actually it's, it's some of the reason why we get such uh, borrowing rates that are historically low for the bonds and the bands. Any questions? No, that's great. Thank you, Pete. All right. Hey, Pete. Yeah. Uh, you may want to comment about what the borrow rates were last uh, earlier this this month. Broke up. What was the question? You may want to comment on the borrowing rates that we achieved earlier this month with these with the bond issue. Okay, um, you, you're taking away from my controllers report, uh, but I. <laughs> Never mind. I actually, I actually is uh, the thirty year the thirty. I, I said this for the I B E T I A C. 17.5 basis points for the, the, the $30 million, uh, the bond issue. It's, it's not a blended rate. It's all general fund five years. Uh, the 12.2 for the 12.2 basis points for the bands. Uh, and then the refundings were uh, in the, I think around 88 basis points. They're gonna be in my controller's report. And um, the, the net present value savings were about 960,000 for the sewer funds over the next, uh, 
few, uh, number of years uh, until they mature. Uh, so the uh, we we did we had more bidders. Uh, I think we had 15 bidders uh, this year for the for the bonds uh, compared to 11 last year. And the bands were not, not as good, but they incrementally were higher than a year ago. Uh, so the bidding was great and the, uh, competitively, uh, we saved a lot of money on interest. So thank, thank you, Pete. I think um, this is excellent. I think it gives us a good base um, of, and shows us how all the hard work that was put in by um, you know, you and, and Roland, the others in the finance department, the importance of the assessor in terms of the re revenue raising and the tax collector, um, all the departments working together, um, it's very successful. And, um, you know, I think this is, is good background to moving ahead. So I thank you so much for everything you do and for um, updating us on these very important presentations. So moving along, I don't know whether, uh, I haven't heard from anyone in the minutes, so I assume we're going to defer those to next month. Is that what we're doing? I did forward just before our meetings um, this morning, a few changes to the December minutes. I could either put them on the screen and we can review them here to act on it, or we could defer it to February. Leslie, I, I don't know what the changes were. I, I'm sorry, I didn't get to look at them. I um, so, so I'll let you, have, did others look at them? Are they, are they okay? Let's just defer it to next meeting. Okay, that works for me. Is that okay with you too, Andy? Sure. That's yes, that's fine. Okay, great. So um, then do I have a motion to adjourn and, or I should, I should just remind everyone that our February um, 17th meeting, um, you know, begins at one o'clock, one o'clock, one o'clock. And um, that also um, next Tuesday is the kickoff of the fiscal year 22 budget um, beginning at 6 p.m. So on the 26th. So do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Just moved, Andy second. I so all we're all in favor. Thank you yep. so much. Thank you to everyone.